Good morning, Wellspring. I'm Dean Oshiro, and I'm a member of the Wellspring family. Today, I'll be reading the scripture, Ruth 2, 1 through 16. And we, I'll be reading for the New International Version. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, why do you, what, who does that young man belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And wherever you are thirsty, and whenever you are thirsty, go ahead and get a drink from water jars that the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a pe people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. She when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. She got up to glean. Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheavers and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. This is the word of God. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jimiko Nakagawa, and it is great to worship with you this morning. I am very, very excited this morning, and because we get to read the book of Ruth together, and I'm just so excited. Uh, Ruth is such a brilliant book, as I have mentioned before, and there are lots to like about this book. And one of those reasons, uh, one of the reasons why I love the book of Ruth is because it's unconventional. The book begins by introducing six characters. There is Elimelech and his wife Naomi, and their sons, Malon and Killian, and their wives, Orpah and Ruth. But as soon as the book begins, in the very first five verses, all three male characters gone. And the rest of the book is about these remaining three women, about their voices and their decision when women were given virtually no voices in the society and the decisions were usually and generally made for them. 
Women's Voice and Ruth, unconventional, but very biblical. And one of the voices God hears is the pain of Naomi. Having lost her husband and her sons, she is hopeless and angry at God, very understandably. Naomi urges Orpah and Ruth to leave her, and each daughter-in-law eventually makes their own decisions. Orpah leaves Naomi, uh, so not to be a burden of Naomi. Ruth stays, and not only stays with Naomi, she recommits herself as Naomi's family. As we see in Ruth chapter first, uh, 1, 15 to 18, Ruth and Naomi become a family. Not a family bound by blood or by marriage, but rooted in Ruth's solemn commitment to God. A family of God in Ruth, unconventional but biblical. Later in the New Testament, we see Jesus brought his mother Mary and his beloved disciples John together as a family in Christ at the cross, which is in John 19. In Ruth and Naomi, in John and Mary, and later in examples of early churches in Acts, we see the glimpse, a little tiny glimpse of family in Christ, what the family in heaven looked like in eternity. The family in eternity is bound by nothing but the blood of Jesus and blood of Jesus alone. Family of God in Ruth. Unconventional, but biblical. And the list goes on and on. The book of Ruth is filled with unconventional but positively biblical teachings. Uh, the storyline, the characters, little expressions, and other many wonderful details of the book speak of God's unfailing, never-ending, amazingly generous love, and all points to what new heaven and new earth will look like. Now, let me ask you this question. Did you notice something unconventional in the passage Dean just read for us? It was Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 through 16. And actually, at this point, I'm going to invite and ask Dean. He generously agreed to uh, do this again, but he's going to read it for us again. So this time, let's listen to Dean's reading and see if you notice something unconventional in this passage. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, who does the young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is a Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheavers behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and wherever you are thirsty, or whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the jars as the men have filled. At this, 
she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, she offered her some roast, and he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. She got up to glean. Boaz gave the orders to his men, let her gather among the sheavers and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. This is the word of God. Thank you so much, Dean. I didn't think he, he knew that he was going to have to read twice, but thank you so much for reading the passage so wonderfully, not once, but twice in today's service. Well, everyone, what do you think? I think God speaks in a multitude of voice. So you probably noticed something that I didn't, uh, and I'd love to hear it. So go ahead. I can't see exactly, but if you had like, hey, I think this is what I noticed, go ahead and share in a chat if you like, or just jot it down. But I'm, I'm going to just share what I noticed. Um, for me personally, what I found unconventional in this passage was the posture of Boaz. A woman like Ruth, a Moabite, a foreigner, a widow without children, were as often res held responsible for their own misfortune at that time. People look at her and say, well, she's having a really hard time, but maybe that's because she worship her God, not our God. Maybe because, you know, maybe her husband died because she probably did something wrong. So God is doing that for her. And then she even look at, uh, people even look at the, um, the fact that she didn't have a kids. People look at her and say, well, look at that. That's another reason, another evidence that something is wrong. She did something wrong. So people in Bethlehem might have pitied her and I felt sorry for her, but definitely held her responsible for all her misfortune. But as Ruth and the, the verses he just read, the Ruth uh, chapter 2 verse 11 to 12 tells us that that's not how Boaz saw, saw her. When the culture of the time normalized the blame on the poor and the vulnerable like Ruth, Boaz sees her through a different, different lens, how God sees her. Boaz sees uh, Ruth and sees someone just like him, a person who is doing her very best to be faithful to God and God-given family, Naomi. So he shares food he has in abundance, and uses his power to welcome her into the community. He cuts the cycle of prejudice against Ruth and treats her with respect. That's one thing about Boaz's posture I noticed, that there's a gaze of Jesus, gaze of God that he sees her through. And the second way that I noticed his posture was unconventional it has to do with how kind of power system worked back then. Boaz was rich and powerful. He was well-respected in the community. And back then, 
a man in his position and a, po a possession were entitled to be served by people who had less. But instead, Boaz used his riches and power to serve, not to be served. And by doing so, he is reversing how the world worked. The world then, and to some extent, even today, the world says, there is a rich and a powerful in the world, and they have a lot of rich and a powerful that they deserve it. And they oftentimes take a lot from the people who don't have as much as they do. And the world then and today says sometimes it's okay, oftentimes more than sometimes okay, for the powerful and the rich to be served by the one who don't have but Boaz, the one with the rich and the power, instead of saying, hey, look at what I have, look what you don't have, you should be serving me, his posture says, I'm gonna share what I have, the power and the riches, to serve you. Instead of assuming that he's to be served, he's sharing to serve others. This was unconventional, but biblical. Matthew 20, 26 to 28 tells us that Jesus didn't come to serve, have a servant to obey him, but he came to serve, to be a servant. Jesus used what he had to heal, feed, um, teach, gather, cook, and pray, and to serve. The most powerful, almighty God shared everything he had to serve the ones without the power and the rich like us. He had everything in the world and instead using that as the reason why people should have served him, he said, no, no, I'm going to share what I have to serve you and ultimately save us. But of course, these are not new teaching to you. All of you know that. Many of you, if not all, are already so good at it. So good at sharing your power and riches to serve others. You are so good at it. And that might be why, if you didn't notice Boaz's posture as unconventional, that may be why, because it is so, just it's a part of your nature now. And I am repeatedly inspired by how you are living as it is in heaven on this island in this area. About a year ago, I moved to Hawaii with just one friend, no family, no community, and to an empty apartment. But today, my life is filled with friends. Um, I have community and my room is also filled with things, sometimes almost too many things. In my room, when I look around my room and my life, it is just there's so many evidences that there are so many boas on this island. Many of which, a lot of them that I have uh, now is shared by my friend and let's call her Mrs. T because uh, I don't think she liked to be named in <laughs> online spaces. So Mrs. T, she became one of my very first friends on this island. She shared um, and she, uh, she welcomed me into her circle of friends and family. She actually welcomed me into her actual house to live with her for a while and shared everything she had with me so generously. She gave me the majority of what's in my place right now and what's in my life. The nice carpet that I have and the mattress I sleep on were given and delivered by Mrs. T's family. And my, my couch was from, it almost looks new couch, it was from her friend. And a countless everything else in my apartment, including the dining table, the chairs, the kitchen goods, were all given by Mrs. T. And throughout this past year, not only she was sharing all these things with me and welcoming me into her life, she kept asking me one question that embodies her Boa's heart. The question was, what do you need? Yumiko, what do you need? 
She keeps asking that question over and over and over to me. And it's not just Mrs. T that asks me that question. Many of you in this community keeps asking me, what do you need? What do you need, Yumiko? So I know that this island and you, this community is filled with the people who has a heart of boas. So the question for this week, perhaps the challenge is more about how to respond to the question than answering, because we are in the middle of the sermon series called I've Meaning to Ask series. Uh, you can, I encourage you to go back to the, uh, our YouTube channel and catch up if you have missed the past sermons because there are a lot of great questions that I have meaning to ask but I haven't asked the people and these sermons challenge you to do so. But this week's question, what do you need? Uh, that might be something that I don't need to encourage you to ask because you already do ask that question so much. I don't know about you, but for me personally, the heart, the challenges, as I said, is how to respond to the question. When people ask me, hey, what do you need? Even when all this repeated question from this community and from Mrs. T, what do you need, Yumiko? My immediate response has always been, without thinking, oh, I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm okay. It's always that I don't even think, what do you need? Oh, I'm good. No need. That's the automatic response I have said. And it just comes out from my mouth. I don't even think. And I might be wrong, but I have a hunch that I'm not alone here. That many of you on this, on this service today may have that auto response set in you as well. And maybe because you really don't need anything, maybe you, all your needs are met and that's great. But maybe for some of you, maybe that's because that's how you were brought up. I notice Americans, um, American people place high value on self-sufficiency and independence. And maybe that's why many of you just automatically say, oh no, I don't need anything, I'm good. For me personally, it is the fear of being a burden to someone that stops me from responding to that question honestly. But as I was preparing this message and studying the text, I realized that's not how Jesus was. Jesus was very good at asking what do you need to people through his action and through his words. But he was also good at responding to the question. Yes, Jesus came to serve and not to be served. That's true. But that doesn't mean he kept saying, no, no, I came here to serve. So no, 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 I don't, no need. I don't need anything. I'm okay. There are instances where he asked for what he needed. Mark 14 records that in Garden Gethsemane, he needed his close friends to pray and be with him that night. And he didn't hesitate to ask. On that cross, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are lots in this few words, but one thing we see is his intense desire for the triune intimacy with a full foreknowledge the separation from the Trinity is imminent with a full commitment to take up on all the pains, and all the separation for the sake of us. Jesus still cries out on the cross, God, my God, I need you right now. You see, as a fully God and a fully human, the mighty divinity of Christ coexisted with human vulnerability in Jesus. Jesus was okay with him needing his friend's prayer and his father's presence. He was willing to share his needs with his friends and family and his God. And that, that Jesus, this Jesus is the Jesus I want to be like. 
Jesus in the Bible doesn't minimize the needs of others as well as his own. Whether that's a spiritual needs, emotional needs, practical ones, big needs, small needs, he doesn't minimize any of those. In that culture, we praise self sufficiency and stigmatize dependency. It may sound unconventional for us to admit our own needs, weakness, and needs for others. It is indeed unconventional, but biblical and good. It is good. So today I want to leave you with two invitations. First invitation is to swap out your responses. So when people ask you, hey, what do you need? Let's take that as an invitation to share, uh, share by yourself, but also God's encouragement to be open to others. I know for myself, it is really hard to unlearn the old habit of like, nope, I'm good. So for some of us, maybe a baby step is replacing I'm good, no need with let me think. So I'm going to tell myself when people ask, hey, what do you need? And feel free, feel free to test me if you like <laughs> and help me train myself at this. When people ask me, what do you need? I'll fight the urge of saying no need and I'll say, hmm, let me think. And I'll pray to Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit encouraged me to share about myself with the person who reach out to me and say, hey, what do you need? That's the first invitation I'm gonna leave you with. Second quest invitation is to keep asking the question, what do you need to people around you? Again, many of you are doing so good already, but we can build on our godly habits. One of the way to do so is when the Holy Spirit prompts you to ask the question, even when you feel like, oh, there's no way I cannot meet this person's needs or what this person may need, uh, you don't, please know that you don't have a responsibility to meet all their needs. Asking question is a mere invitation for engagement and it is a way to convey that you see them and you care. And one other way that we can keep kind of asking the question, what do you need, is for us to maybe pause and think, what ways are you a Boaz? In what ways you are a Boaz? In what area of life God has given you an abundance? Maybe you are trusted with the financial wealth by God. Great. Who is Ruth in your life? Who does not have what you have in abundance? Maybe what you have in abundance is relationships. Maybe you have a big family. Maybe you have a great circle of friends. If so, who is Ruth in your life? Who in your community, in your social circle, in your neighborhood, or even on this island, who does not have what you have? And this may be someone who may be rich in material ways or powerful, but without what you have, meaningful, life-giving relationships. Maybe what God gave you in abundance is an endless heart to pray. Who then is Ruth in your life? Who, at this moment of all these challenges in life and society, who you see that they don't have in them to pray to our God. What has God given you in abundance? In what way God made you a Boaz? And in what way are you a Ruth? Relationally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, materially, we are all Boaz in one way, and we're Ruth in another ways. The book of Ruth encourages us to keep asking and keep responding to this question, what do you need? 
in a Christ-like way. And as we encourage each other to do that, as we practice asking and responding to the question in Christ-like way, let this be an encouragement to you. Uh, maybe one thought, uh, hopefully that will encourage you, is that in the book of Ruth, one main character's voice is missing. This is the book that God does not speak directly, explicitly. God's words are not recorded. God is invisible in this book. We don't see uh, God as the pillar of fire. We don't see people listening to God's voice like Moses did in Exodus. Instead, what's given to us in this book are the voices of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. And all three of them embody God in their own unique ways. We see the strong and the rich, the poor and the vulnerable, and bitter and disappointed. And God is in all of them. And that's what we're called to do, Wellspring. We as a community are called to embody the different voices of God in our weakness, even in our strength or even in our struggles. So let me close this time with a prayer of thanksgiving that we have this community to encourage one another to do that and ask God's help for us to be the community. Keep asking and responding. What do you need in Christ-like way? Would you please join me in a prayer? God of unending love, we give you praise, we give you thanks for the way you have designed this world, to design each of us. You made each one of us uniquely and you decided to pull all of us in this one community to love one another. And this week, we want to try, ask and respond to the question, what do you need? in an honest and your, your way. So help us, God, give us an eyes to see Ruth in our lives. Give us a strength and myth, the areas that we are Ruth, and trust the community that we can be both Boaz and Ruth at the same time. Thank you for the family and the Christ you have given to us. Thank you that we don't have to do this alone, that we get to do it together. Lift up all the knees, all the Ruth is in among us, um, in us this moment. Help all of us to see each other as you want us to see each other. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.